as we're working our way through uh, this letter, there's no shortage of of important topics. It's almost like, in a, in a sense, I don't know if you've sensed this, but I kind of feel this way. It's like we're in this kind of this this area where it's topical. Last week we we talked about the 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 topic that Peter brought up was uh, how the church should view and interact with government and governing authorities and great lessons for us. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, the attitude that God wants us to have on the job. I was talking with one of you earlier and they said, well, this doesn't really apply to me because I'm retired. <laughs> not true, not true, <laughs> your wife would say. I'm not mentioning any names, Rick. Uh, anyway... <laughs> <laughs> it's the attitude that God wants us to have in our work and in, in our service. We're, when we get to chapter 3, we're going to be looking at how this all works out in marriage and in the, the home in uh, regard to how to have a godly, godly marriage relationship. We're looking uh, here to, to begin with, we're just going to be looking at verses 18 through 20. So, Read along with me. 1 Peter chapter 2, 18 through 20. Peter writes, Servants, be submissive to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and gentle, but also those who are unreasonable. For this finds favor if for the sake of conscience towards God a person bears up under sorrows when suffering unjustly. For what credit is there if when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? But if, when you do what is, but, but if when you do what is right and suffer for it, you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. He begins with this, this word. It's translated here in the, the New American Standard as servants. In the NIV, it's slaves. The, the word, it's not doulos, it's a different word. It literally means house servants. Now, in order to understand this passage, in any of the passages in the New Testament that have to do with slaves or slavery or, or servants, we have to do a little bit of work because we have a, we have a different Generally speaking, we have a different concept of slavery than what was referred to here in the context of the New Testament. In the Roman Empire of Peter's day, there were approximately 60 million slaves. Part of the glory of being a Roman was the idea that you could basically own servants and not have to do menial labor. They, they enjoyed that as citizens. The, the menial labor was to those servants that they had in their employ or that were serving in their household. In the earlier years, Rome had conquered other civilizations, and as they had conquered other civilizations, they took people captive. These, these who were among the, the 60 million at the time of this writing were not necessarily those people, but the children of those people, people who were just born into this. This is all they knew. But the slavery that existed in the day is not like the slavery that we think of in terms of America. These slaves were not treated for the most part in the way that the slaves here in America were treated. These slaves enjoyed a, a lot of blessing. Even though they were in the same way owned they were, retreated, they were treated with respect and almost like family members. Some were even paid a wage. And, and they could also buy their way out of slavery. 
it wasn't just a dead end. They could actually save up their money and buy their way out of it. They were the workforce of the day. You guys, you guys have heard that before, right? That should be nothing new to you if you've been in church any length of time. It, it needs to be said. This was the labor force. And it wasn't, just, it wasn't just menial tasks. These were doctors and nurses and teachers. These were the class of people who just did the work. <laughs> while, the, while the Roman citizens laid around and ate grapes, you know, whatever they did. They were managers and overseers and skilled professionals. Very different, very different from the context of uh, what we think about in return in terms of what went on here in America. And so it's important as we consider this text and the application of it in our own lives and our own situations that we see it for what it is. This is the workforce. And so the instructions... The instructions and the application of the instructions are for us who labor, right? Any, any kind of work, if you work, this instruction is for you. And I would say if you don't work, you should work. You know, in some way or another, we all work. Topically, I would just say it this way. These instructions are like a chapter in an employee manual. You know, if you, if you go to work for a large company, oftentimes you get an employee manual. It's, a, it's the guidebook. It's the rules. This is what we expect of you. This is what God expects of each one of us. Just as in the earlier passage, if you were here last week, when we were talking about the, our relationship to the government, the attitude that we ha- should have, that the scripture tells us, is that we need to have an attitude of submission. I don't know if you enjoyed that last week or not. Uh, I I think I made it really clear. I I think it's common for us to, on some level, not really like it. I don't really like to be submitted. I don't really want to be in submission. I think in regard to work, sometimes it can be very difficult to work in submission to another person. It's that same word, hupotasso, to line up under. It's a military term, to fall in line to take orders, to take instructions from someone else, to take directions, in this case, from a master that we might say is a a boss. And the scripture makes it really clear, to do so with respect. Now, right away, just like last week, as soon as we talk about this, there's a whole list of, yeah, but, right? Because we would have this argument Certainly this isn't, you're not talking about my boss. <laughs> Anna, I'm going to be watching you very carefully. <laughs> no. and, and Peter, and God's word actually anticipates that, that kind of like, but you don't understand, my boss is a real jerk. Which probably all of us, all of us, if, you, if you've been in the work force at all, you've probably worked for somebody who was a jerk. I, I worked in retail for 15 years. And in, in, in that, I worked for a lot of different people at a lot of different times in a lot of different situations. And there were great bosses and there were bosses that I could not stand. There are good bosses. There's good employers. Right? There's, there's people with good management styles and the, that are easy to work for, and then there's others that you just dread. Regardless, c- clearly, clearly the scripture is saying, regardless. As a Christian, as a disciple, a follower of Jesus, you have an obligation to respectful servitude. Even to unreasonable bosses. What's unreasonable? That's kind of a moving target. What is unreasonable? Again, we would say, well, certainly you're not talking about my boss. Unreasonable, the word unreasonable is the Greek word skolios. Some of you, you, you're you're familiar with that term. We get the the, the word skoliosis. It's to have a, a, a curvature of the spine. 
It literally means someone who's crooked. The application of it, I'm not talking about you if you've got scoliosis, I'm not trying to make fun of you, but, but the idea here is if you've got a crooked boss, that's unreasonable, someone who's a jerk, whatever. This is used, this, this word is used actually a little bit differently in Acts chapter 2, verse 40. It says, with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. There's another a use of the word where it's, it's translated a little bit differently. Perverse is, is the same word. It could, be, it could be crooked. You might have a perverse boss. You might have a crooked boss. Even, even this boss, even this employer, you need to submit to in a respectful way. Even your terrible boss. Should we just stop there? Is that enough? <laughs> like if you're working right now, you, you know this is, this is sometimes incredibly difficult. I think sometimes we pass off, we preach Christianity as though it were an easy thing. It's easy to come to Christ, right? You just put your faith in Jesus. But walking the walk, being an actual disciple of Jesus... You, you'll notice over and over and over again in, in the Gospels, Jesus is turning people away. No, you, this is a call. This is a serious call to follow him. And that means taking verses like this and really seeing it for what it is, recognizing this is the word of God. This is instructions to us. This is how we are to, to work. Now, Good bosses sometimes can be another problem. We all want good, but we want great employers, right? You guys remember a couple weeks ago, someone stood up, I think it was when we were given Thanksgiving, and, and one, of the, one of the sisters stood up and said, oh, I've got this great boss. She's a Christian lady. That's wonderful. It's great to have a good boss. Praise God for that. But good bosses can be their own issue for us as employers or employees, because there's a temptation to take advantage of your good boss. There's a temptation to, to work your good boss, your good employer. Or, or even to do less. Well, you know, he's a Christian, she's a Christian after all, so I could probably get away with a little bit of this or a little bit of that. We could take advantage of a good-natured boss. It's an obvious blessing, but we have to guard in that situation, we have to guard against becoming lazy or somehow taking advantage of that situation because God calls us to something else. Respect and honor and servitude. And, and, and again, this is topical. Peter doesn't bring this up, but I'll bring it up because I think it's important. It's a, if we're looking at this as like an employee manual, this applies to Christian service. Church, this is something that I've seen over and over and over through the years. Where people say, well, well, these are the responsibilities that I have at work. I understand that. Got to show up on time. Got to dress a certain way. You know, there are certain demands. But then in service to God within the scope of the church, it's like people can sometimes be lazy about that as though that were an insignificant thing. That's wrong. That's wrong thinking. If you teach Sunday school, you should understand that for what it is. You're influencing little kids for Jesus Christ, for their lives. It's a serious thing. It's a calling. It's a glorious thing. You know, this is where D.L. Moody started. The great evangelist who preached the gospel to over a million people in his lifetime, he started by teaching children in the poor areas of Chicago. He took it seriously. Whether you're teaching Sunday school or whatever it is, you should approach your service to God in the same way. You should be willing to take direction. In any service, there's going to be somebody who's over you, right? There's going to be someone who's, who's in charge, you gotta, you got to take direction. 
And here's the thing. You don't get to serve any way you want. Just like when you show up at the job, you don't say to your boss, yeah, I don't want to do it your way. I know you guys have some sisters and procedures, but I'd really like to do my own thing. Well, it doesn't work on the job. It doesn't work in the church. Now, it's not as though you, you can't bring ideas to the table. And if you are serving in the church, you have a good boss, hopefully. You know, someone who's kind and merciful and all that. But you can't just do what you want. You, you, you serve in a, in, a, in a submitted way. And you show up on time. You show up on time and prepared. The, I've seen it over the years. I've seen so many things. Guys come to church and they're coming to serve. And it's like, dude, I can tell right away you are up way too late. You know what I mean? Or it's like, uh, you know, uh, well, it's just, it's just this service. Oh, it's just this service to Jesus that doesn't really matter. We should, we should approach our Christian service with an incomplete sense of sobriety. As though we were serving Jesus directly. I was at this church not too long ago. And uh, it was so weird. I, I don't know. I have this thing about shorts. Like, I like to wear shorts. Shorts are cool in the summer and all that. I, I have never, I've never preached with shorts on. Maybe at a family camp or something. I don't know. But it's like, I just, I, I, some of these guys that are so, and I know some, some people would look at even the fact that I got jeans on as like, uh, you know, a little bit too casual. But I was at this church and the worship leader, like he had like a ratty old t-shirt on and cut off jean shorts and flip flops. And we weren't in Southern California. <laughs> and I was just like, dude, you look like you smell. I mean, I mean, I mean, seriously, it was like, it was like, okay, I get the hippie movement and everything, but it's like, you know, you're leading worship for the congregation. You wouldn't show up, you wouldn't show up in any kind of job where you're serving people. You wouldn't show up at McDonald's, you wouldn't be a greeter at Walmart looking like that. Well, anyway, uh, you get my point in the way that we should, that we rightly should approach our, our work, that applies to Christian service and probably so much more. Now, Paul gives us complementary instructions in Colossians. You're probably familiar with this verse, but it, this is a, probably another page or another section in the employee manual. So like I said, this is a little bit topical, but this is what he has to say uh, on the matter in Colossians chapter 3, 22 through 24. He says, slaves in all things, obey your masters who are on earth, not with external service as those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do your work heartily, as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you'll receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. Wow. This, he's talking to workers. Have this, have this kind of attitude. Have a, have a sincere heart. And don't just give lip service to your boss. You know what that's like. I don't really respect you. And, 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 and we do our work, but we do it begrudgingly. We're unhappy employees. He says, no. Do this just like you're doing it for Jesus. It's powerful, isn't it? It's convicting. I've been in a lot of... I've been in a lot of situations where I know I have not done well with this, with just different bosses that it's like, uh. It's important to understand. This is what God, this is how he wants us to approach any kind of work that we do. We should be, just as I said last week, we should be the best citizens. We should be the best employees. You, if people know that you're a Christian, you should back that up by being the best employee. You should be employee of the month, every month, whether it's acknowledged or not. 
Seriously, and not for some, and not for some award or nowadays, you know, the employee of the month gets a parking spot. You know, <laughs> I see those spots and it's like, oh, I want to be employee of the month. You're not doing it for some award or some recognition from the company. You're doing it because you're honoring Jesus. It's the Lord Christ whom you serve. Now, it seems from the emphasis that Peter gives, he's anticipating that the Christian would more likely suffer under a bad master or employer than a good one. Statistically, I'm sure that's the case. Certainly in his day, that was the case. This was, this was long before labor unions, you know, the National Labor Relations Board and, and, and workers' rights and on all the different things that we enjoy in our country, not necessarily transferable to other countries, but certainly we enjoy a lot of rights and protections, and that's a great thing. In this day, probably there wasn't a whole lot of that. He gives us the reason. He gives us a motivation behind all of this. A couple of different things. But he says simply, this finds favor with God. You could, you could restate that a lot of different ways. You could say this is what God wants. This is what God likes. This pleases him. This is what he honors. You honor him, he's going to honor you. This is what he desires. This finds favor. Look at the whole verse there, verse 19. If for the sake of conscience, and this is Peter's emphasis. His emphasis is on those who, as it says, uh, for the sake of conscience, God, a person bears up under sorrows when suffering unjustly. So what's supposed there is a bad boss, a bad employer, a bad master. Same idea is, reverted, or is mentioned in verse 20. Well, the, the, the idea that it finds favor with God. What? The idea that we bear up under mistreatment. I, I want to be pleasing to God. Don't you want to be pleasing to God? I want to have the favor of God in my life. Who doesn't want to have the favor of God? It's insane to even think about. Why does God care about our work? I don't know if you've ever processed that. I understand why God cares about my work. <laughs> but why does God care about your work? And you might think, well, this is what I do. It's like, I'm, what are you talking about? Why does God care? What does he have to do with my work? There's nothing. There's nothing in your lives for which God does not care. Do you know that? He does care. And, and according to this, clearly, he cares how we work. He cares how we work and the attitude of our heart. Now, he says, this is, this is part of the motivation. It finds favor with God, but there's this, this phrase that he uses, for the sake of conscience towards God. For the sake of conscience towards God, this is, we bear up under it. Some of the other translations are, are a little bit helpful in understanding this. Uh, it says in the NIV, because he is conscious of God. The ESV says, when mindful of God. And so the whole idea is, you're bearing up under mistreatment on the job, and, and you're doing well with it because you're thinking about God. While on the job, while doing whatever menial task you might think it is, for which, what does God have to do with it? And, and here's the thing. The scripture gives us a conscience. Like uh, my hope is, and I think certainly Peter's hope is, you read this and all of a sudden your conscience is alive because you now, now you know what the word of God is in regard to your work. And you can no longer be on the job. And this is the way the Holy Spirit works. He'll nag you the minute you want to start complaining about your boss. He'll nag you. <laughs> He'll remind you of this. You, the, the Word of God gives us a conscience. And, and we should be mindful of God, not, not just in our work, but all the time. I don't know if you've learned in your Christian life to live that way, but we should be mindful of God in all that we do, even on the job. 
Maybe you're the worker who probably like all of us, again, I, I'm guilty in so many ways in the past in, in this work. You may be a worker who all the time is thinking, while you're working, I hate this. You ever found yourself in that boat? Where you're just doing something, maybe it's something repetitive, or it just seems of no redeeming value, and you find yourself in it, doing it, and it's like, ah, I hate this. And you, you watch the clock because you can't wait to be done. Well, I would say, just anecdotally, find a job. If you can find a job that you enjoy doing, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. People sometimes, they're loyal to a fault, to some company or some vocation. And it's like, dude, especially right now, there's a lot of jobs out there. And it's, it's such a blessing if you can find something that's fulfilling, that actually you enjoy doing. But thinking like a Christian, It'll help you to enjoy any kind of work. Maybe even the work that you have that you don't like. But you might be the person who says, I can't wait to get off work. Uh, or or, or you're, you're, you're being mistreated and you're thinking, man, I'm being mistreated. I don't like this. I don't like the way they're treating me. And my boss is a jerk. And you could just fill in the blank. The company, the boss, the individual, whatever it is. That kind of attitude conversely, does not find favor with God. You shouldn't expect that on the job you're going to be blessed while you're having that attitude. Having a good conscience or being mindful of God is remembering these things. Be submissive. Again, this isn't, this isn't instruction that's easy. We find it sometimes very, very difficult to be submissive. To say, yes, sir, no, ma'am, or yes, ma'am, or whatever, you know. To to say yes to our employer, to say, okay. And I I mean, obviously, unless your employer is trying to get you to do something that's immoral or evil, be subservient. Be obedient. Follow the rules. Follow the instructions. Work hard. God wants us to be hard workers. Now, I think some people take this so far and and work actually becomes an idol. That's a whole other problem. But work hard. Again, why? Because you're serving Christ. That's the mindset that the Christian has. Your, Your work is in some way, it's pleasing to God as you're serving properly. God wants us to be submissive. God wants us to be hard workers. God wants me, God wants you to work just as though you're serving Jesus personally. And certainly, when we have harsh treatment, when we bear on, up under it, as the scripture says, God's, God's watching. He's paying attention. And we don't, I, I would just say we don't understand it. I don't understand it, but it finds favor finds favor with him. It's not, as though, it's not as though God wants us to suffer unjustly for no cause. Right? I think someone skeptically could look at this and go, oh, this is just terrible. Your God wants you to just to suffer. It's not just that he wants us to suffer with no cause, but suffering is in line with his redemptive plan. Again, this is where Christianity is soft-pedaled, and, and it, it's not right. It's, 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 it's one thing to come to Christ. It's another thing to follow him. And it's not easy. It's not for the cowardly. It can be difficult. But he has a plan and he's working it out. And in, in trial, bearing up under mistreatment, the thing is we grow. I don't know if you've experienced that, but it's just absolutely true. When you do this, you personally, you grow, so long as your mind is on God. This is where we learn to trust Him. And you know, Christians have suffered for all time. The suffering that you have on the job is nothing. You know, it's, I wouldn't pass it off as though it's insignificant, 
But it's just in the context of all of Christianity, it's light. In Hebrews, of course, you know that great chapter in Hebrews 11, talking about the men and women who pursued God. They, they trusted him with their lives. And we've got this list of all kinds of mistreatment. Hebrews 11, 35 through 38. They were tortured, not accepting their release so they might obtain a better resurrection. Others experienced mockings and scourging. Yes, also chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. Stoned, they were sawn in two. They were tempted, they were put to death with the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, ill-treated. Men of whom the world was not worthy, wandering in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. This is the whole list of other people not mentioned by name in Hebrews 11, who experienced all kinds of difficulties. Throughout history, Christians, followers of God, have always been persecuted. We've always had trouble. And Jesus warned us of this. He told his disciples very plainly, Matthew 24, 9, they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you. You'll be hated by all nations because of my name. <laughs> Again, it just, it goes so far beyond the way Christianity is sometimes presented. Just pray a prayer. Say this thing and you'll be a Christian and your life will be great. No, if you're going to follow Jesus, there will be difficulty and sometimes that difficulty will be on the job. Again, Jesus said this, John 15, 18 through 21. If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. If I were of the world, the world loves its own. But because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they'll persecute you. If they kept my word, they'll keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know the one who sent me. Now, I'm belaboring this point. But suffering mistreatment, it should be expected. And going through it properly, going through it properly finds favor with God. We grow in faith. And I think it's also, as, as Jesus points out there in John 15, 21, it's also important for us in our mindset as we're following the Lord and on the job and suffering persecution of some sort or some difficulty. He says they're doing this because they don't know the Father. When people do bad things, when people do terrible things even to us, we should have the same kind of sympathy that Jesus had. Right? You don't know what you're doing. They're doing this because they don't know the Father. Now, I would just say, again, our context is talking about suffering unjustly on the job. There's a difference between, and, and, and Peter points it out, there's a difference between suffering justly and unjustly. He says, what credit, verse 20, what credit is there if when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? Here's the thing. Here's my translation of that. If you're being mistreated because you're a jerk, you deserve it. I mean, seriously, if you're a bad worker... You should expect that you're going to be mistreated on the job. It, it kind of just makes, I mean, that's his point. There, there's, no, there's no blessing for that. There's nothing remarkable or commendable about suffering when you deserve it. If you're acting badly, don't claim persecution. Oh, Christian persecution, Christian persecution. It's an attack of the enemy. No, you're being a jerk. You're being a bad employee. You know, if you don't show up on time over and over and over again, no one's going to like you on the job. Hello? Right? If you're the person who calls in sick all the time. I'm just speaking of without cause. I remember one time working with this Christian lady. She's a wonderful lady. I, I, I love her to this day, but she wasn't particularly well liked on the job. And she was the one who was always, praise the Lord. Oh, praise the Lord. And she would always bring up Christian things and she'd always try to steer the conversation to Christian ideas. That's great. But she was lazy. 
She didn't work hard. She just wanted to chat. And she was always the person, and I remember this, it'd be time to clock out. And she would take the last five or ten minutes of her shift kind of just wandering around to the time clock. And it's like, what are you doing? You're still on the clock work. But she was just known for this, and because of that, she wasn't very popular. That's not Christian persecution. It's, no, you're just not being a good employee. Again, we should be employee of the month, every month. Amen? 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 Amen. <laughs> it's, our, it's our witness. Not only is it pleasing to God, but it's a witness. We are a, a witness to the world. Just as in, just as in the, the submission to government, go back to, to look at verse, this was the last week's lesson in verse 15. Such is the will of God that by doing right, you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. People, people have all kinds of things uh, that they say or speak against God or speak against Christianity. But by your good behavior, you basically shut them up. People should know you're a Christian and they should also know, man, that guy, that gal, they're the best worker ever. I, I love that person. You know, there's that old saying, don't be so heavenly minded that you're of no earthly good. You guys heard that before? I think it's nonsense. If you, if you have a conscience and you're mindful of God, which is prescribed, you should be of ultimate earthly good. Like if you're thinking about God all the time, you should be the best worker. You should be the most helpful person. You should be the best person with customer service, whatever it is. With God's help, you should be a better worker and a better witness. Now, Peter reminds the church as he, as he proceeds in this, he reminds the church of our great example. Look at verse 21. We'll read through the rest of the chapter, 21 through 25. He says, For you've been called for this purpose... Since Christ also suffered for you, leaving an example for you to follow. Who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed. For you were continually straying like sheep, but now you've returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. He says, you're called for this purpose. Kaleo is the word they're called. It's, Peter uses it several times, I think six different times in this letter, he uses this idea of called. It's invited or summoned. You've been called to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Called to be a, a, a follower of him, a follower of his teaching. Is it any wonder that we are going to suffer unjustly? Again, I think, I think sometimes in the way that Christianity is presented, we leave this part out. And it's a mistake. There is a cost to discipleship. And when we read the New Testament, we see Jesus in the Gospels warning about it, and we see it play out in the book of Acts. We see it throughout the letters. There's much difficulty. And here's the thing. I, I don't know. If somehow in the 80s and 90s or whatever... Somehow being a, a Christian was presented as a cool thing. And we got these Christian celebrities and all this stuff. It's like, has the way the world perceived the Christian message changed? I don't think so. It's only when we abandon the Christian message that we can expect suffering and mistreatment from the world to go away. And many people have kind of lapsed into this. Even whole movements and churches have lapsed into this kind of non-confrontational, passive kind of Christianity where we'll just, just go with the flow. 
And that somehow the world be won to Christ through us just kind of chilling out. When the salt loses its saltiness, it's good for nothing. Only to be thrown out. We're called for this purpose, and it involves suffering unjustly at times. We have an example, and Peter says we need to to follow this example. We need to follow in his steps. There's five things that he lays out here. The first one is Jesus' example is this. It says he committed no sin. Now, anytime we're looking to, we're looking at Jesus in his earthly ministry and we're going, oh, here's our example. Well, right, right away we got a problem with this one because we're not Jesus. A- and we do sin. A- admittedly, we sin. The Bible says if you say you have no sin, you're a liar. Right? We sin. And so we, we have to understand this. But the idea is that we should endeavor, like him, as we're following him, to live holy lives. I mean, that should be the pursuit of our lives. To to not indulge in sin, but to to work towards not sinning. And you understand the application of this on the job. And here's the thing. People, and again, I see see church and and, and movements of Christians, they they feel like people are going to be led to Christ if we just compromise that. It doesn't work that way. This is a great mistake. It's easier, right? It's easier if we just take this lesson off and we take that moral teaching off and we just, well, we'll just be a little bit more like them and people will be impressed by that. It doesn't work that way. God has called us to be like Jesus. I mean, that's the definition of being a disciple. We're following Jesus. He's the example. We're looking at him. We're reading his word. And we're trying to get our lives to line up with what it says. And this applies in all of our lives, certainly on the job. I think in our work, and brothers, I know this is a problem for some of you. Sisters, maybe you too. But on, our, on the job, we can compartmentalize our lives. Well, here's what I like. Am I like at church? I'm a Christian at church. Oh, I got my wife or my husband or my kids, so I'm a Christian at home. But on the job? You know, it's on the job. I can be a different person on the job. And we can compartmentalize our lives where somehow we're a Christian in certain circumstances, but on the job, you know, it's kind of a rough thing. I'm a construction worker or whatever it is. And so, you know, this is the expected behavior. No, you're not called to be like them. You're called to be different. And it's not easy. It's not for the weak. It's not for the cowardly. It's for the followers of Jesus. I'm not saying, and I don't think this is the the point, is that we live with sinless perfection. But we strive to be like Jesus. And and maybe striving to be like Jesus is the wrong phrase. I, I think it's probably more like this. We let Jesus be Jesus in us. Lord, shine through me. Lord, use me. As I'm submitted to Jesus... That's what people are going to see. And it's less a, I'm going to just try to be good, as much as it is, I, I, I want Jesus to shine through my life. Because we're a witness. We're certainly a witness on the job. And, and when you do sin, own it. Like, it's, it's amazing. I, and I remember times. I remember times where I blew it on the job, and, and I had to go and just say, hey, you know what, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, was, I didn't do what I was told. I was arguing with you or I was whatever. You know, I was a bad employee. And it's amazing how the world just kind of goes, what? Like, it's the very thing. Isn't this the thing that you wish people in public life did? 
like all the politicians or whatever, they're caught, they're guilty, the whole world knows they're guilty, and it's like, I didn't pull the trigger. You know, it's like, it's like, what? No, we should be the people to say, you know what, I, I did that, and I'm sorry, that was wrong. The world needs to see that. He committed no sin. It says, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. This is the second thing. He didn't lie. How about that? Come on. It, it seems like it's something that doesn't need to be said, but it does need to be said. The Christian should be known for being straightforward and honest, not liars. Jesus is our example. Let's be like him. Obviously, in all spheres of life, certainly on the job. Now, I love this one. It says, he didn't revile in return. Jesus was accused of being possessed by a demon. I mean, they said things of him that it's like he's the son of God. He was healing and talking about love. He was bringing hope to the whole world. And they said, oh, he's obviously possessed by a demon. Like they said some evil things of him. And not, not just how they treated him, but what they said. He didn't revile in return. That word, the, it, it means a harsh railing, which not, which not only rebukes a man, but also sharply bites him. Ooh, I like that. It gives you an idea of what you're talking about. It's not just a rebuke, it's a rebuke that hurts. This is the way he was treated, but he didn't respond in like manner. In Isaiah 53, it says he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that's led to slaughter, like a sheep that is silent before his, its shearers, so he did not open his mouth. This is, a this is so challenging. Again, what do we do? We're talking about Jesus as our example. This is his example to us, his followers. This is what he taught us. Don't revile in return. And here's the thing. I want to speak up. You mistreat me, I want to speak up. I want to see you out in the parking lot. You know, right? It's like, I, I don't want to put up with that. If you're acting unjustly. Now, now I don't think this has to do with, you know, if, if, you're, if there's some gross immorality, right? We're, we're not talking about that. Look, like if you're being abused in some ways, we're not talking about that. We're just talking about your boss is a jerk or whatever the situation might be. There is this temptation in all of us. That's the way you treat me. And you're getting it back. That's not the way Jesus operated. That's not what he taught us. We cannot live an eye for an eye. Don't match bad behavior with bad behavior. I got this great illustration. It, it actually came off of Facebook. I saw one of my friends had this meme and it caught my attention. It says, the problem is I want to follow Jesus and slap people too. <laughs> I'm in, I'm in, I want to know. And, and I know this, the gal that wrote this, I've, I've known her since we were in elementary school. And uh, so I read, this, I read this thing and I asked her, I said, can I use that? And so Tracy, this is for you. Uh, she told this story, just bear with me, it's kind of long, but it's a great story. She says, I was a little bit of a Grinch to a fellow Grinch today at the checkout at the Dollar Tree. I don't go often. It wasn't busy at all. Guy in front of me put two items down. Checker rang him up. Then he said, whoops, I forgot a couple things. Can you please cancel that and, and, and let, let her go ahead of me? The checker acted rude and slammed his items into the bag and said, I already rang them up, so no, I can't do that. I giggled and said, well, yes, you can. Yes, you can. But okay. She gave me a dirty look. And I said, I don't mind waiting, but please don't say that you can't do it when we both know that you can. <laughs> she started going on about having to do a void or delete. And, and I said, well, that's the same thing as canceling. Oh, my gosh. She got so angry, and she raised her voice and told me not to argue with her. I told her, I'm not arguing, I'm stating facts, and obviously that makes you angry. 
Are you telling me that if you rang someone up and they didn't have enough money and they walked out of the store, you couldn't cancel the order? I kid you not. She said, I can't. I told her, you're lying. I said, of course she can scan them back for a refund or do a void or something. She started yelling at me and told me if I didn't stop arguing, I'd have to leave the store. I laughed and asked for the manager. She told me she was the manager. <laughs> so the guy came back and he had uh, he'd heard part of the conversation. He apologized and paid for the rest of his stuff. I smiled through my mask and told him I didn't mind waiting and was going to tell the checker, that, but she insisted she couldn't void your items. He smiled back and rolled his eyes. I didn't say anything more, and I checked out. She didn't say thank you or have a good day. I didn't either. Then I went to my car. This is where it gets good, but not very nice. I went back into the store, grabbed three items, went to her checkout. She scanned my items. Looked through my, I, I looked through my wallet. I'm sorry, I don't have any cash with me. I won't be buying this stuff. <laughs> she, glared, she glared at me. I smiled as I walked off and said, Merry Christmas, have a nice day. <laughs> she, said, she said, that's pretty childish. I said, well, well, obviously you were lying and I proved my point. The cashier behind her was facing me and behind her manager's back and started laughing and gave me a thumbs up. <laughs> I should be embarrassed, but I'm not. I shouldn't waste my energy or negative things on people, but I did. The sad part for me is that I went there to look for a nativity scene of some sort. <laughs> Boy, uh, I need a good kick in the butt. Jesus is the reason for the season. I'm going to be on my best behavior at least until after Christmas because I don't want to be on the naughty list and, and I want to have a clean heart and conscience. Merry Christmas, LOL. <laughs> <laughs> now, it's, it's not directly what the scripture is talking about, but we've all been in that situation where it's like the way you're acting is wrong. On the job, sometimes it's the way you're treating me is wrong and I'm going to give it back to you. And I love that my friend, she recognized that, yeah, this isn't the best behavior. But we've all been in that position where that's the way you're, I'm going to give you back what you're giving me. Jesus says, don't do that. Just be quiet. Just endure it. Be like me. The fourth thing is it says he uttered no threats. This is the part where when you're watching or reading the story or seeing it portrayed in some way, it's like, I want Jesus the superhero. Jesus submitted. He submitted to mistreatment. Willingly. Though he is God. He was suffering as God. And so many things he could have said, like, when I come back. <laughs> right? I mean, you know what he said? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. What a great example. This is the grace of the Lord. His power always restrained by love. I would just submit to you, that's what the world needs to see. Not, not us lashing out. Not us with, with retorts. Or, or, or coming back at people, or, hey, you know, I'm not going to put up with that. It's probably fair to ask at this point, yeah, this, this submissiveness, this doormat Christianity, putting up with mistreatment, does it work? Is this really any way to live? Whether or not it works, or exactly how it works, isn't really any of our business. It's not really my business. My business is to follow the example of Christ. That's the call of Christianity, is to follow Jesus' example. And we do this by faith. The fifth thing, it says, He was entrusting Himself to Him who judges righteously. 
And I would just say in all of this, and in every difficult aspect of our Christian walk, it's by faith. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't play out in the world very well. In fact, it does not make sense. It makes more sense to, to take up arms, you know, to have a revolt or, or whatever, you know. But this is what he calls us to. Trust me. This is my way. This is the way of the master. Follow it. And then Peter closes with the redemptive result of Jesus' conduct. The result of his conduct. As we're looking at him and considering him and all these things, the result of his conduct is he himself bore our sins on his bo- in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you were healed. How about that? By his submission, the world could know salvation. You and I are saved because of what he did. It's all of it's redemptive. And he wants us to live this kind of redemptive life. Trust him for, trust him for the fruit of it. But this is how he works. This is how he operates. By his wounds, you were healed. Amen to that. Because of what he did, you and I are saved. Did it work? Yes. We were like, we were like straying sheep. But then, but we returned to God. Because of the beauty, because of the glory, because of the attractiveness of Jesus. I'm telling you, this is what the world needs to see. The world needs to see people who are following Jesus. And that applies in your home, in your schools, in the job, in your neighborhood, on the soccer field. Wherever it is you find yourself, people need to see Jesus. Now, it's not our conduct by which we're saved, right? You can have a list of things. I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. It's not those things that save you. It's because you're saved that you do these things. This is written to the church. It's assumed everyone who's reading this in the church has a relationship with Christ. But then we also know that it's not true. You could be reading this and and maybe you, you haven't been healed spiritually. Maybe you haven't been forgiven. Forgiveness is offered to you by the Savior who suffered and died on the cross. Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty for your sins. Have you received that forgiveness? Are you done straying? I I love this. We were continually like, like straying sheep. That was all of our lives apart from Christ. Are you done with that yet? Have you come to a place where you're done? I remember the day when I just said, I'm done with that. Glory. It was glorious. Every one of us needs to come to a place where we're done running from God. Rather, we come to Him. We return to Him. If you're here today and you've never asked Him to forgive you of your sins, Jesus wants to forgive you. This is why He came. He didn't come so that we could just sing wonderful songs at a certain time of life and bring in Christmas trees and have this birthday celebration. He came to save the world. He came for you. He came for me. And not just us, but for people we know. Your coworker, your boss, maybe even your boss who mistreats you. If you've never put your faith in him, I'm going to pray and lead you in a prayer. And you can can ask Jesus to forgive you on your own. And and I, I certainly hope you do. Father, thank you for your word. God, thank you for these instructions to the church. Such rich and great application for all of our lives, Lord, that we would learn how to serve you. God, we just ask maybe even for the first time, Lord, forgive me of my sins. Lord, forgive me for my straying. Forgive me for uh, my trying to do it on my own apart from you. Jesus, I want you. I want you to come into my life with your grace. Forgive me. Release me. Heal me. Bring me into that right relationship with the Father. 
that your word speaks of. Lord, we pray that all of us pray that together. In Jesus' name, amen. 